and we'll give it a go. Okay, so today we're going to talk about the basics of photography. We'll talk a little bit about composition as well. And I think it's important to start in the world of photography uh, for two reasons. One, in, in all likelihood, if you pursue architecture uh, as, a, as a major and or a career in the future, you're going to be given projects where you're going to go to a particular site that exists somewhere in the physical world, and you're going to look around at this particular site, and then you're going to be responsible for designing a building that goes onto that site. And in reality, you can't design the whole building while you're out on the site as much as we might like to. You're going to go back to your office, and you're going to do the work in your office. Okay? But you're going to need something that's going to inspire you or make you remember what the site was like when you were out at the site. And chances are you're going to take pictures. That's your way of remembering what the site is like. So learning how to take good quality pictures can matter. Okay? It's going to help inspire you. Certainly also, when we get to the parts where you collage in an example of what your building uh, or your structure looks like in the context of the scene, having a good picture to start from is certainly a lot better than having a poor picture. So it's worth it to at least talk about photography. The other factor, especially in a class like this, is we're going to move into learning Photoshop next class. And it's a whole lot more effective if you do work on your own photos than to just randomly pick photos from, say, Flickr or from Google Images. Because if you've taken the photos, you learn a lot better what steps you need to take to make your photos better. Okay? So we're going to start with this introduction to photography. And when we're talking about photography, we kind of have to start with an introduction of terms, um, a definition of terms, so that what I talk about will end up making sense. So I have some visuals from my camera bag that will help um, explain the kinds of things that I'm talking about. <clears throat> but we're going to start with a camera body. And the camera body is essentially a light-proof box that contains some kind of sensitive material. So I have a picture of one here, but I'll pull mine out as well. Um, so you've got your, in this particular case, it's a digital SLR camera, uh, which just means that the lens is detachable. Um, so the camera body is this part without the lens, right? The lens is separate. This is the light-proof box, right? Obviously, I have to have the lens on it for it to be light-proof. Um, but this light-proof box then, right, protects the sensor that's inside the camera, right? And the sensor only is exposed to light when you actually take the picture or the exposure, okay? So uh, in the world of film, right, does anybody remember film? Maybe a few of you remember a thing called film, right? It's kind of entertaining. I, we date ourselves really quickly if we, if we admit to having used film in the past. Film was this, this substance, right, that you bought at the drugstore that when it ex was exposed to light, right, created a negative image of the particular photograph. And you, you used to have to buy it. Uh, it was in a little roll, and then you used to have to take it to a place and have it developed and whatever. No more, right? Instead of film, we have um, a digital sensor that acts as film. It's a light-sensitive sensor. Um, and so now we don't really talk about film anymore. But there's a few holdovers in the world of photography to film. Um, so it's, it's inevitable that we at least have to discuss the fact that in the old days, it was film. Okay? So then we move forward into something called aperture. And let me dig out a, a visual example of aperture here. Aperture is the circular opening in the lens that lets the light into the light-proof box. Okay? And this physical opening can vary in size. Uh, and that's important. So the final amount of the image that's in focus is determined by this aperture. Right? And we'll talk about that in a second. So uh, this is probably the easiest example, uh, live example. So it's dark, so it's hard for you guys to see. But you may be able to see a little tiny point of light in there. right? That little tiny hole is the aperture. Okay? It's really, really small in this example. Um, if we change, however, and go like this, you guys can probably see a lot more light coming through that particular image. Okay? That's when we have a really large aperture. So a lot of light can come through this particular image. Right? So if we look at the, the photograph examples here, of this in the non-live sense, right? We have the little tiny aperture, the small aperture, and we have the really large aperture. So if I was trying to shoot an image and it was dark, right, which would I rather have? Right, probably this one. A lot more light can come into the image. Okay? This one, 
would be more if it's a really bright scene or something like that. But it also controls something called the depth of field. And this depth of field, basically, you've probably seen this in images. You might have a piece of the image that's nicely in focus, right? And then the stuff behind it might be blurred out. Okay? So if we have a really large aperture, right? Big amount of light coming into the image, we get a small depth of field. So the background is blurry, the subject of the image itself is crisp and sharp. Okay? The opposite is true if we have a really small aperture. Right? So if we have a tiny little circle, right, we're going to have the opposite. And I'll show you an example in just a second. Okay, so another example here, this is an f of 1.8. An f-stop is the way we um, distinguish what aperture is. So you'll see f, lowercase f, slash some number. Right? The smaller that number is, the larger the aperture is. Right? The higher that number is, if it was an f16 or something, the smaller the aperture is. Why they make it an inverse relationship, who knows? Right? Just the world of photography. Okay? So it results in a blurred image um, if you have a small f-stop, which means it's a large aperture. Okay, so here's the slides that I wanted in comparison. Okay? So this is an f1.8, really big. Right? It was actually this image was shot with this exact lens. Okay? Um, so at f1.8, we're looking at that wide open. Okay, So that's what shot this image. And you can see that just the tips of this pedal, these pedals are actually in focus. Right? Even the back sides of the pedals are blurred out. So it's a very, very shallow depth of field. If, however, we are trying to shoot a photograph of a landscape, something like this on the California coast, Right? We might pick something with a higher aperture, or excuse me, a smaller aperture, a higher f-stop, right? such that the stuff that's in the foreground here, the ice plant and that sort of thing, is in focus, as are the cliffs, as are the hills in the way back. Right? So depending on the type of image we're trying to shoot, we want to be able to vary what the aperture is to get different depths of field. Make sense so far? Okay. So here's a good illustration um, coupled with the actual apertures, right, or drawings of the aperture, and what it does for the image. Right? So we've got the image of the tape measure. We're going to start down here at the f1.4. My particular camera doesn't go to 1.4. It only goes to 1.8. Um, but in this example, they're showing it as an f1.4. The largest aperture we can get is the shallowest depth of field. Right? So we look right here. It's focused on the number 20. Right, on the tape measure, and we can't even go right, to the number 10 right, or the number 30 without it getting too blurry. Okay? As we move over and the aperture gets smaller, you can see that we get a little bit bigger depth of field, right? a little bit bigger depth of field. And as we move over here all the way to f16, right, really small aperture, we end up with almost the beginning of the ruler and the end of the ruler in focus. So you can see really easily through this set of <coughs> images how the depth of field changes depending on what your aperture is. So we have aperture, and then we couple it with something called shutter speed. And shutter speed is probably the easiest part of photography to understand and, and comprehend. And that is the amount of time that the light-sensitive material in the old days film, today it would be the, the sensor of the camera itself, is actually exposed to light. right? How long? And it's usually fractions of a second. So a typical exposure might be 1 125th of a second. So a really short amount of time. Okay? If we get up into the 1 1,000th of a second or something, it's for like freezing action shots. Okay? So let's look at some examples of how this affects the final photo. Okay? First one is 1 50th of a second photograph of a, of a waterfall here. And if we look at this image, we can see that, yes, it's a little bit blurred, but we can essentially see the individual drops of water. Right? Now, of course, we're here. We're on a projector. It's not as clear as it would be if we were on a nice you know, retina display or something. Okay? But we get the idea. We can still see individual drops of water in here. We can see the individual waves in the pool. Right? We do have pretty good exposure at the rock level here. But as we advance forward, so this is one tenth of a second. You notice what was individual little droplets right, are now starting to, to form lines. 
they're starting to blur a little bit the longer exposure. Okay? We can still kind of distinguish that there's a row of drops or a line here and a line here. So they haven't melded together completely. At one tenth of a second, we can still distinguish all of the waves at the bottom of the pool. Right? They haven't smoothed out yet. So let's, let's jump forward half second. Okay? You see that all of this is starting to get much, much smoother. Right? Much less individual um, pieces. It's starting to all blur together. Likewise, the pool at the bottom is starting to smooth out. We're not seeing, seeing the ripples like we were seeing. Okay? Let's jump forward again. Okay, one second exposure, right? This is almost entirely just blurred color now. We're not seeing indi any individual droplets at all. The pond is also becoming almost um, a smooth pond, okay? So this is taking place over a second. Obviously, the water is moving. Also notice that these are starting to get very, very overexposed, right? It's hard to compensate for that um, the longer the exposure is. OK, so a little bit more dramatic of an example. Um, but sometimes this is helpful to see it at the other extreme. 160th of a second, so pretty fast exposure. right? Wave crashes into stump. Spray is caught mid-spray. Okay, It's frozen in time. Four seconds, right? same tripod, same exposure. right? We get a complete blurring of the water as it's running up and down the beach. right? No spray whatsoever. Right? Because that spray is, is, is come and gone during the course of the photograph. Right? A um, little bit subtle changes, but this is pretty well exposed, so it's consistent. But you can see what the difference in the shutter speed actually means. OK, so then we have something called ISO, uh, which is essentially a holdover from the film days, where you used to go to the drugstore and you would buy a particular type of film. And this particular type of film was more or less sensitive to light. Okay? In the digital world, we can just arbitrarily change how sensitive is the sensor going to be at this particular moment. Okay? So it's designed to mimic film, and it can help in low light conditions. How many people have taken an image that looks like this? Right? Chances are you have. And it generally comes from your cell phone. Right? Notice the difference in the size of this lens versus the lens on my phone. Right? They're different. No matter how large the aperture gets on my phone, it's still significantly smaller than any aperture coming out of this camera. Okay? So in low light conditions, right, one of the ways of compensating for the amount of light that can just physically get through the lens right, is to make the sensor more sensitive to the light that's coming in. Unfortunately, the more sensitive we make that sensor to the light, right, the more likely it is we're going to get this noise or pixelation in the final image. Okay? So depending on the sensor, depending on the size of the sensor, depending on the lens, right, these values are going to vary. So here's an example of an ISO of 1600. Okay? It was shot with a digital SLR, not an image I shot. But there's very little noise, even though the ISO is really high, right? probably because a fairly large amount of light could come into the, to the lens. You wouldn't expect to be able to shoot at ISO 1600 from your cell phone. Right? The lens just wouldn't support that. Okay? So let's look at a, a, a comparison. This was a point and shoot camera. It was a, ca a, a Canon Elf, or excuse me, a, a power shot. Um, but it's a good comparison of how ISO. So if we get, get at the basic ISO of 100, you can see that we can basically see all of the lines on the ruler. We can see some of the text on this particular photograph. If we jump to the mid range at about 18, 800, excuse me. We can still see 18. We can still see 20. The lines are starting to get a little bit blurry, but we're starting to get a little bit more noise. right? And if we jump all the way up to an ISO of 3200, you can see how much noise. We can't even read the ruler anymore. right? So depending on what setting you have your ISO set for, right, you're going to get more or less noise, clearer or less clear images. right? Now again, if you're shooting with your phone, there's not a whole lot you can do. But if you're shooting with an actual camera, you can go in and change and adjust some of these settings. OK, so white balance uh, applies only to digital cameras. And it's basically an adjustment of the relative colors um, and the perception of white. Okay, So if you were to look around this room right now and look at people that had white on okay, as their clothing, that white would appear maybe slightly bluish. 
maybe slightly yellowish, or maybe true white. My guess is it would be slightly blue, okay? And that's coming from the variety of light sources that are in this particular room. So a lot of you have your computer monitors open, and there's blue light coming from those, okay? We have the projector, which is relatively neutral white light, providing light. In the back half of the room, we have some fluorescent, which might be skewed a little bit blue. It depends on the type of bulbs that are in that particular setting. So if I were to shoot an image, right, I might get an image that turns out more like the one on the left. How many people have ever shot something that turned out like that? Okay? It's not uncommon in a digital camera. What that means is that the white balance, or the white point of the image, is unfortunately set a little bit too blue. So what is white in the image, right? let's take the street marker here, the crosswalk, what is supposed to be white is actually a little bit bluish white. Okay? The good news is, in Photoshop or in a lot of photo editing programs, it's very, very easy to change this after the fact and make it look like it should. Okay? So in this case, we have it corrected, same image, it's just been corrected, right? This appears true white, okay? So um, it's just important to recognize that that can vary, and it is specific to digital cameras. The good news is it's extraordinarily correctable. <clears throat> so we'll move on into something called bracketing. Um, and bracketing is essentially deliberately taking um, photographs in a series such that one of the images is exposed to what the camera thinks is correctly exposed, right? One is deliberately darker, and one is deliberately lighter. So it's a bracketed set of images. Dark, medium, or correct, and then light, okay? And the bracketed set doesn't do a whole lot um, on its own, but what we can do is we can take a set, that set of images, those three, five, or seven images, and we can combine them together into an image that's called a high dynamic range image. Okay? How many people have ever tried to take a picture of a sunset? Okay? I hope you have. Right? Sunsets are pretty. Okay? How many people have looked at their photo after they took the picture of the sunset and said, ew, it didn't look like the sunset? Right? Very, very common. Okay? A photo like this is pretty close to what the sunset looked like. Okay? But this is not a true photo. It's a high dynamic range photo, which basically means that I took three individual photos, one deliberately dark, one deliberately correctly exposed, and one deliberately light, and I combine those three images together to make a, an image that represents the way our eyes see light. And we'll spend a whole lecture talking about this, and we'll spend a whole lecture talking about panoramic photography together um, and how the two work together. But essentially, this is a very specialized type of image that responds differently or, or, or attempts to show the way our eyes see the world. Okay? Those of you that were in Rhino, remember we talked a lot about uh, HDRI images, background images. right? This is essentially the other side of it, how you would create that and then use it uh, in something like Rhino. Another example of a high dynamic range image, we can push the envelope of them being a little bit surreal instead of being truly realistic. Uh, depending on how far we push the post-processing. So aperture, which we talked about, and shutter speed, which we talked about, have an inverse relationship to one another. So if we took an image that was correctly exposed, and we wanted to make the background a little bit more blurry, so we wanted to make the aperture right, larger, we wanted to increase the aperture, right, we would have to decrease the shutter speed to correspond. Right? So they have an inverse relationship. So for example, if we had an f11 and we wanted to drop it to an f8, right, it would have to go from 1 60th of a second to 1 125th of a second. So increase the shutter speed to decrease the aperture. Right? Increase the aperture, decrease the shutter speed. Does that make sense? Inverse relationship. Now in reality, you're not going to have to do this. But if we were taking a class that was on actual photography, right, they'd walk you through these kinds of relationships. For us, my goal is to make you take your camera off auto mode and use one of the presets as opposed to just full manual mode. It's unlikely, uh, certainly in this class, that you will get to full manual mode. Anybody in here a professional photographer by any chance? No? OK, good. <laughs> so whatever I tell you is, is right. Okay. Um, I actually, one year, I had a professional photographer in the class. 
And it was quite entertaining because it was like, would you rather come up and, and give this lecture because this is what you do for a living? Um, but she didn't, and she said I was fairly accurate, so that's good. Okay, so exposure value, uh, this is a chart that will allow us to reverse engineer a particular scene, okay? So we can use something like this where let's say we were outside, right? And we wanted to shoot in natural light, we wanted to shoot a rainbow, we were in Hawaii, okay? Clear sky background or a cloudy sky background, okay, let's say it was a clear sky, it was a blue sky with a beautiful rainbow, and we wanted to shoot it, we'd be looking for an exposure value of 15 to shoot this, right? And so a good photographer would have these things memorized and would, able, would be able to just do it, that's what makes them professionals. We're not professionals, so we have a chart, or we just use the auto settings on our camera or the presets. Okay? So what we would do is we're looking for <coughs> an exposure value of 15. Right? We'd go across the top and we'd say, what aperture did we want to shoot at? Let's say it was 8. Right? So we'd come over here to 8, and we'd come down to 15. Right? And we get that my shutter speed should be 1 500th of a second for the image to be properly exposed. Okay? Now, thank God for computers right? and digital cameras. They ca calculate all this stuff for us, so we don't have to worry about it. Okay? This is the same chart. It's just a little bit more complicated and condensed all into one image. To me, it's a little bit hard to read. So we move from exposure value, right, which is properly exposing something, to something called exposure compensation. Right? And this is something that even my very basic iPhone can do. Right? And what exposure compensation does is it says, the camera says, I think the correct exposure for this particular image is this. And it's at zero. Now we can, from there, say, no, actually, it needs to be a little bit darker, or it needs to be a little bit lighter. Right? And so we can compensate or override for what the default camera is going to produce. So let's look at an example. Okay? So we have the picture in the center here. right? That's the standard exposure. That's what the camera thinks is the correct exposure, which in this case isn't too far off. Okay? And we can then go in and compensate. Well, it's a little too dark. I want to lighten it up. We go from 0 to plus 1, and we get this, which is a much lighter version of the same image. Right? So we're compensating. Okay? If, however, we thought this wasn't correct and we wanted to go darker, Right? We go from 0, and in this case, we're going to minus 2, a little bit more extreme example, and we get a much darker image. Okay? So if your camera doesn't support auto bracketing, we talked about bracketing before, you could bracket a set of images by using exposure compensation, right? deliberately under and overexposing an image from where the camera thinks is what it should be. Okay? So that's exposure compensation. So some notes on lighting. And I think this is something important um, to kind of distinguish. And I'm going to go on a few tangents today because I can't resist, right? Even though I can't really talk anymore and my voice is probably going to go. Um, stories are too fun not to. So I was on a, a field school in Peru. We were, we were doing digital site documentation of, a, of an Incan city that is obviously in ruins now. It was a mud city. It wasn't up in the highlands by Machu Picchu. It was down uh, in the flatlands by the coast. Uh, it was a mud dwelling known for some of the best preserved um, wall paintings um, that were left from the Inca um, uh, civilization. So anyway, so we were there, and it was a combination of architecture students and archaeology students, right? And we each were there for different purposes, and we were obviously collaborating on, on this study. Uh, and it was quite amusing to watch, <clears throat> because all the architecture students would get up early, I know it's shocking, architecture students and early, or stay up right to the sunset, and we go running around like crazy shooting photos. Okay? Well, at the beginning of the day and at the end of the day, right, the sun is low in the horizon, and we get lots of dramatic shadows. We get dark blacks and rich colors right, as part of the images. So we were taking these, what we thought were artistic images, that represented what the architecture looked like. Okay? The opposite was true with the archaeology students. Right? While we were all taking our nice little naps around noon or eating lunch, right? they were frantically working because the sun was highest in the sky and most neutral for photographing the wall paintings and stuff. So they were looking for very neutral, even light, no shadows. Right? So it's very different depending on the purpose of your particular endeavor. Right? So in my case, <coughs> 
as the architecture student, right, I wanted those rich shadows. I wanted to show the architecture. The archaeology students, however, wanted the opposite, right? They wanted even light. They wanted to compare one painting to another painting, okay? So it's just important to note. So let's talk a little bit about file types and, and how we're saving the images, okay? So a JPEG is by far the most common file type, right? If you took an image with your phone, it would come out as a JPEG, right? What JPEGs are, it doesn't matter that it stands for Joint Photographic Experts Group. Nobody really cares anymore, okay? What it is, is it's a type of file that compresses information. And so if we took the full information of a photo, right? When we go look at the photo, there's a bunch of stuff that's in it that we just don't really care about, right? It's kind of like uh, an MP3 format audio file, right? There's sounds that we can't really hear, so we can strip them out and make the file size smaller. Same thing here. There's stuff we can't see. Let's strip it out, make the file size smaller. So it's usually about 10 to 1 in its compression. So if we took it the full, complete image, maybe 16 megabytes. The JPEG version of that would be maybe 1.6 megabytes. Right? So it's a file size trade-off. Um, but it's also the most common type that we share. You're, of course, going to create tons of these as the course of the class goes on. Right? Uh, TIFF is a tagged image file format. Uh, it has compression in it, so it's better than just the, the, the basic image file. Um, <clears throat> but it depends on the type of compression as to whether they strip information out or not. Right? It's very common as an output for like high dynamic range images. Right? It's a, the, the precursor to an HDR, a .HDR file. And then we move into something called RAW. And if you're shooting with any kind of a non-phone camera, chances are your camera has the ability to shoot in something called RAW. And what RAW images are is it's every piece of information that the camera captures gets stored in that file. So it doesn't strip anything out. It doesn't compress anything. Obviously, the file sizes are the largest. Um, for a, a normal camera, a RAW file is somewhere 12 to 20 megabytes a piece per picture. Okay? But it allows for far greater flexibility. If you make a mistake and you don't expose the image correctly, you can go back and correct it after the fact, because right? you have all that information. So let's show you an actual example to try to make this sink in. So I have an original image here. It was a JPEG file. Okay? It was overexposed. I lost a lot of detail in the kind of the white area of the picture. Right? I'd like to have that detail back. So I did some post-processing. In this case, I did the post-processing in Aperture, but you could just as easily do it in Photoshop. Um, and if we look at the white area, it's like, OK, well, I got some of the information back. right? I can see a little bit of the peeling paint here. It's not quite as washed out. But the whole image just kind of was ugly. Right? It kind of got blah and kind of gray and whatever. So if instead of shooting in a JPEG, I shoot, I sh I shoot it. Great. I shot in a raw file, right? same overexposed image, right? I can manually go back and adjust the exposure and again, I did this in Aperture, but you can do it in Photoshop. And I can get every piece of detail about what this paint looks like and how it was peeling. Okay? So the flexibility in a raw file is far greater when it comes to post-processing. The sacrifice is, of course, how much space it takes up, the size of the file. Okay? So um, if you're shooting uh, with a camera that's not your phone, you might consider shooting in RAW, depending on what your end result is going to be, right? or how much post-processing you want to do to a particular set of images. OK. So let's talk about your camera okay? and how the camera works. It doesn't matter whether you have this camera right, or you have this camera. It essentially works the same way. We have something that's called a sensor that's inside the camera. Obviously, the iPhone sensor is a lot smaller right, than the big digital SLR camera sensor is. Okay? But what that does is as light enters the camera, right, it, can, it, it records what colors of light have hit the various um, pieces on the screen. So if we did a blow up of it, we'd have a filter that goes across with red, green, and blue. Right? As those pixels come together, they make the overall color of the image. Right? Um, this kind of goes into color theory, which we'll talk about, I think, in lecture 117 or 118 or something like that. Um, and that color theory has to do with additive color and how we combine light together to create a particular color uh, in an image. Anyway, we'll get to that. Okay? 
So if we looked at it in this sense, we take the picture, right? Image goes into the camera, goes onto the sensor, light falls on the sensor, sensor records what it, what it sees, so to speak. That gets translated into a digital stream. We then manipulate the digital stream in something like Photoshop, okay? So typical compact camera, something like this. It has a built-in lens. Flash is relatively close to the lens. Um, has some kind of a touch screen on the back that lets us control what we're doing, right? Um, your phone is probably the most compact example of a compact camera, right? A digital LR is the opposite of this. Um, it generally has a detachable, changeable lens. Uh, there's some hybrids, uh, smaller SLR or digital SLR-like cameras that allow you to change lenses. Uh, the advantage is that you can get a lot more light through a lens, and you can get very specific types of lenses that can go on the camera. Um, <coughs> the trade-off is it's generally a much bulkier file, or much, bu excuse me, much bulkier camera to be carrying around, right? If I were to be walking around and I had this strapped on, right, something like this, right, I'd look like a tourist because I'm walking around with the camera on, right? I've done this. I've carried this camera a lot of places, but you have to be comfortable with a big, kind of bulky, heavy camera, right? Likewise, if I'm carrying my whole camera bag, it's a pretty heavy bag um, versus, um, you know, something like this that I can slip in my pocket. So there's certainly a trade-off for what you get. So if I don't, if you don't take anything else away from this lecture, I hope you take this away, and that is that on your camera, phones excluded for the moment. There are things more than auto mode, right? And if you shoot in more than auto mode, you generally will get better quality images, right? So let's talk a little bit about the standard modes that are generally available on a camera. Um, there's usually a video mode, which we're not covering in this class. We're not doing video editing at all. Um, there's generally some kind of a mode that looks like a flower, which is designed for close-ups. You want to take a, an image that's a, you know, a foot away from an object, you would switch to this mode, OK? generally going to blur the background a little bit and give you a nice focal point, OK? There's generally a night mode. What night mode does is it says, I want really long exposures, right? So you wouldn't have to use the night mode just for things at night. Maybe you wanted to take a picture of a waterfall and you wanted it to be all blurry. You might consider using the night mode, <clears throat> right? Portrait mode is essentially a mode that doesn't have to be used for portraits, but things where you want the background blurry. Right? So you take one image, uh, and the, the, the foreground, the object that you're taking is, is in focus. The stuff in the background is blurry. Right? So it's dealing with depth of field. Landscape mode is the opposite. I want everything in the image to be exposed the same okay? and, and to be not blurry. Okay? So it's the opposite. So think about the intent of the image uh, and then use the correct mode. Sports mode, I want a really fast shutter speed. <coughs> I want to freeze the action, OK? Um, and then we can get into the semi-manual modes. And what semi-manual modes do is they let you adjust one thing. I want an aperture of this. Adjust all the rest of the settings. Um, you know, the camera can adjust all the rest of the settings. I want a shutter speed of this. Let the camera decide the rest of the settings, right? And then, of course, we end up with full manual mode, which I wouldn't recommend unless you really want to get into photography. So when we think about configuring our options, number one, how much space do we have on the camera? Right? If we have a really small card, maybe we don't want to shoot in RAW. If we have a large card, maybe we do. Right? If we have a lot of space on our computer to do post-processing, do we care about RAW files? Probably not. Right? Something you have to think about. Okay? You want to know about how many images you're planning on shooting. Nothing's worse than being somewhere, taking pictures, and running out of space, and having to look through and try to delete photos off your camera. Right? My guess is you've all done that. It's really annoying. Right? And then what will the final output be? Are you trying to do a big six-foot poster, or are you trying to do a little four-by-six print? Right? That matters in terms of what size. Okay? So the other thing is, what do you carry in your camera bag? What do you carry with you? Right? And it obviously depends on what you're trying to photograph or, or where you're going. The simplest would be, I have my phone. That's it. Right? The most complex would be, I have a big camera bag. It has lens cleaner in it. It has extra batteries in it. It has an extra memory card in it, right? It's got a tripod. Maybe it's a little tiny tripod, right? Like one of these little guys or something like that, right? To make it easy, right? Maybe it has other accessories like a panorama head or, or whatever else, OK? 
okay? Um, the other thing is you want to think about, are you actually allowed to take pictures of whatever it is you're taking pictures of, right? If you're in a museum, you may or may not be allowed to take pictures. You want to be aware of that so you don't get in trouble, right? If you take pictures of people, sometimes it's nice to ask them if you can take their picture first, right? For part of the exercise today, uh, I'm going to ask you to take pictures of people, right? If you partner up with people and take pictures of each other, chances are they're not going to have a problem with you taking their picture. If you, you know, sneak up on somebody uh, and snap their picture, they might get weirded out, right? You might want to ask them first, okay? Uh, the other thing is you want to look at the weather and plan accordingly because, lo and behold, it will rain. So this was part of that same uh, Peruvian trip. Um, we, we went from the lowlands. I'll show you some pictures of that a little bit later. And we went up to Machu Picchu. Anybody in this room been to Machu Picchu before? Nobody. Wow. Okay. So uh, it may or may not. Anybody know what Machu Picchu is? Okay. Still shockingly few of you. Okay. So Machu Picchu was the capital city of the Incan Empire. Uh, it's built at the kind of the top of a cliff, right on the top of this little ridge. The mountains on either side, it's like dramatic drop off and then huge mountains, right? It's very, very spectacular. Um, anyway, um, when people used to visit the city, it was about a four day hike to get to the city. So it's very remote. Um, today, if you're going to visit it, you can choose to hike the Inca Trail, which is the trail that goes to the city, anywhere from four days to one day, depending on where you start and where you end. Obviously, you end at Machu Picchu. Um, or you could take a train and then take a bus. Okay? But unfortunately, the, um, the bus route is not exactly the most spectacular route. So when we were in Peru, um, we decided to do the hike. Um, it was just a one-day hike. But lo and behold, it's pouring rain. Okay? So I have to go off on a tangent because there are, there are moments in your life that you will never forget. And this happens to be one of them for me. So we got off the train at about 5.30 in the morning or so. It was dark, um, and we started on this trail. It's a day-long hike, so we got there up to Machu Picchu about 3 in the afternoon or so. Uh, pouring rain most of the hike. Um, we, of course, being the archaeology and architecture students that we were, had cameras and laptops and tripods and all kinds of way too much stuff that we were carrying with us that really shouldn't have been wet, but we were making do with ponchos and, and whatever. Um, so. Anyway, we were hiking. It was, it was rainy. It was wet. It was cold. Um, but we wanted to get there, et cetera. So as you're hiking the Inca Trail, you're going along higher and higher elevations. Uh, Machu Picchu itself, if I'm not misquoting, uh, is somewhere around 9,000 feet. So you're pretty high in altitude, you're pretty winded as you're hiking. Um, and so we were hiking along in this particular context, almost there, almost to what's called the Sun Gate, which is the entrance to Machu Picchu. And as we were hiking along, the trail kind of bends a little bit to the left. And as you come around this bend, you're presented with this basically wall of stairs as far as you can see. They're all out of rock, okay? And so you get there and you got all your gear on. And you're like, okay, I gotta make it to the sun gate. It's at the top, right? And you're winded and you're breathing heavy and you're trying to hike this, this set of stairs. And so anyway, we made it, right? Which is fantastic. But right as we reached the top, remember it had been raining and cloudy all day, right? The sun broke through and it was like the, the complete uh, moment, right? Right as we reach this. And it's one of those few times in your life where you experience something that makes you realize how powerful architecture can really be, right? So we experienced Machu Picchu the way it was supposed to be experienced. We saw it from the sun gate. We had a much broader understanding of what Machu Picchu was. Now, if you guys all Google images of sun gate, Machu Picchu, and that sort of thing, you'll get images, but it's not the same as being there. It's not the same as the sun shining when you arrive at the Sun Gate, right? Completely magical, okay? If the Sun Gate and Machu Picchu is not on your architectural list of wonders to see, I totally respect that, right? My guess is that you will, assuming you stay in the world of architecture and you're interested in it, you will have one of these experiences in some building, right? And I hope that all of you have the opportunity to travel so that you can have this experience because it really inspires you to want to be an architect and to want to be in this field. Enough of me. On, on tangents. Compositional techniques are as important as any of the fundamentals that I've already talked about, right? Because how you choose to compose an image is critical to the message that you're trying to portray as the photographer, right? And what I'm talking about here is valid in a photograph, it's valid in a poster, 
It's valid in your Mondrian poster that you're trying to do right now, right? It's valid in your final presentation boards for the 221 uh, skyscraper studio, right? Composition matters. It always, always, always does, okay? So let's talk about types of composition or compositional techniques. These are not a one-shot deal. You may have layered compositional techniques. You might have telling a story. You might have rule of thirds, and you might have a strong diagonal. You might have more than one. Okay, But let's talk through what they are. So the first is telling a story. And you can do this in two ways. One, it's capturing the light or the mood or the atmosphere of a particular scene. Right? It's trying to take a person from where they are into the scene such that they can feel and experience what it's like to be standing there. Okay? And obviously, that would be a pretty good goal for a photographer. Okay? The other thing is there may be elements in the photo right, that will lead the viewer into the photo, that will cause the viewer to want to investigate the photo more carefully. All right? So let's try to show some examples. Okay? So this is St. Peter's in Italy. Anybody been here before? OK, this is on your list. And if Machu Picchu isn't, Rome should be, period, end of sentence. If you study architecture, you should go to Rome. Okay, Rome is very awesome. Anyway, this is actually technically in the Vatican, which is inside of the city of Rome. Anyway, details. St. Peter's, right? Beautiful building, right? Religious building. And you can be there in a moment where you have this kind of light that's filtering through. Notice that everybody's congregating in that pool of light. Right? It's a very unique experience. Right? Do, regardless of what religious affiliation you may or may not have, it's still a powerful building to be in. Right? So we take a photo like this. We're capturing the light conditions. This is not at all the best photo in the world, right? but it is capturing a piece of that. Okay? We move from the religious building way up into the Swiss Alps. Right? This is Schneidplatt in the Swiss Alps. And in this particular image, right, again, shot with a, um, not a shallow depth of veal, field. right. So we have things that are in the foreground in focus, things that are in the background in focus. But in this particular image, if you look carefully, there's a trail that runs right along this ridge. And if you keep following it, it keeps going back and back and back and back and back and back. Right? And so it's actively asking you, follow me into the, the image. Right? So a road or a trail can be a really good way of engaging the person who's viewing the image to begin with. Um, this is a really hard image to see on the projector. It ends up too dark. This is up in the Andes in Peru, Machu Picchu-esque. This is not. This is higher uh, in the, in, um, on the way into Cusco, which is about 12,000 feet above sea level. Um, and it's a very interesting kind of environment with the way the light comes in. You're very high. The, the, the high altitude coupled with the snow, coupled with the altitude sickness, it makes it kind of a unique moment. Um, and so this is a particular image that's trying to capture that. Okay. So let's shift gears slightly and talk about another one. And that this, is, this is called symmetry. And obviously, you're all familiar with symmetry, right? One side matches the other side. The key to using symmetry as a compositional technique is to have something that's out of place, something that's out of balance that causes you to focus on it. Okay? So let's look at an example. Okay? Perfectly symmetrical photo of the Brooklyn Bridge walking across New York. Right? But there's something out of place. And that is that all the subjects, all the people that are moving in the photo are only on one side of the bridge. Okay? Now, if we look at it a little more carefully, uh, or if you've been across the Brooklyn Bridge before, you know that it's divided into the bike lane and the people lane, okay, which is why the people are there. But this image becomes that much more powerful because there's something that's out of place. Something draws your attention. Something causes you to want to look at this image and say, what's unique about it? Right? So strong symmetry, except for the people. Right? Here, strong symmetry. It's a little bit blurry of an image. right? Strong symmetry based on this couch. Closed window, closed window, open window. Something different, right? Clean floor, dirty floor. Something different, right? Now, maybe I would have picked just one of those if I were shooting it. One window open, dirty floor, I don't know. But it still works <coughs> as a compositional technique. So we move into radial. This is on the harder side to set up because you have to have 
the conditions that support this type of a photograph. Okay? And what it is is you have something that's in the center and all the elements radiate out from it. So the first example would be this, uh, which I shot in an ice cave in Switzerland. Um, we were hiking on a glacier. It was awesome. Um, anyway, I was a lot younger when I did that. But um, you shot out, looking, looking out past this ice cave mouth, right? And the two points come together in a strong focal point at the center of this image, right? And all of the rest of the ice and everything radiate out from that strong focal point. So it's a radial composition. The other thing that tends to work nicely in a radial composition is something with receding lines going to one vanishing point. So something like a tunnel, right? Where everything goes to that one point and then radiates out from it, right? And again, sometimes it's nice if there's something that breaks that strong radial, like there's a focal point in the particular image or, or what have you, okay? So another example here, we have the, the inside of a hot air balloon, right? The way the seams come together make that strong focal point Right? Elements radi out, radiate out from it. Uh, and then obviously we have the shadows of the people that start to activate uh, this particular photograph or scene. I don't like this image. I should, I should get rid of it. Then we move into something called diagonal. And that is that there's a strong diagonal element that captures the nature of the scene. Right? It directs attention within the scene. Uh, so a couple examples. Um, in this case, it's the shadow of this little um, sand shelf. This is a macro shot close up, obviously at a beach, right? And we have the rocks blurred out in the background, but we have a strong diagonal here that, that guides you through the photo, okay? Another example here from our own campus, right? This is the book drop below the library, right? We have strong rectangle formwork for this piece of concrete, the form ties, but we've got the strong diagonal um, in both directions that create kind of an activeness to this particular uh, image. Right? We can also have something like this with the train and the strong diagonal tracks. Right? The tracks go from the middle of the image toward the front, and they create that uh, dy dynamic di diagonal. Ugh. OK, so next would be overlapping layers. This is where we have something that partially covers up the next thing, that partially covers up the next thing, et cetera. Right? And the more of these layers that come together, the more somebody viewing the image might want to weave in and think about what these various layers are or what they become. Okay? So I'm going to use the, uh, the Tombow, Colorado, the mud Inca City as an example here, um, where you might set up an image that's something like this, right? where we have one set of walls. Right? We look through that to the next set. It has the niche and the window. Then we look through the window into the next set. Right? So it's a layering up. Um, as a part of the compositional technique. We could also uh, look at this as symmetry, because the first image is relatively symmetrical, and then we get to the two niches, which are asymmetrical. Right? So again, it's layering. Just to tell you kind of what this site looks like, um, so you have some context, um, this is part of the, the, the city um, with all of these niches and these overlapping layers. Uh, you might have something like this, where we have just layers of light that are going back and receding in this particular image. We have the foreground of dark shadow, meadow. We've got the sliver of light. We move to the next shadow. We move to the next ridge of light. We move to the trees. We move behind the trees to the pond. We move to the next layer on the other side of the pond. Right? Then we move even further to the layer of trees. Then we move to the meadow. Then we move to, you get the idea. Okay? So it's a layering up. So then we move probably to the most common rule. Anybody heard of the rule of thirds before? Okay? If you don't take anything away compositionally, take the rule of thirds away. Right? It by itself will make the biggest difference in um, your composition. Okay? It's one of the simplest rules to follow. It basically says if we have an image, right, we're going to take that image and we're going to divide it in thirds. One, two, three. And we're going to divide it this way in thirds. One, two, three. Now, lo and behold, there's a pretty good chance that if you were to take a picture with your iPhone, this grid shows up on the screen. Right? Chances are, if you look through the viewfinder on your camera, right, or you looked at the back of your camera, it probably has the grid. <laughs> if it doesn't have the grid, you can probably turn it on. Okay? So what we want is we want to put any of the primary subjects. Right? I'm taking a picture of the person. 
right? The person shows up on that third line, right? The background, maybe the ground, this is all grass, right? It falls on that third line. That make sense? Okay, so let's look at some actual examples. Picture the Statue of Liberty, okay? Roughly a third over is where we've set her, okay? Furthermore, the base is roughly a third up from the bottom of the image. So instead of having an image where the Statue of Liberty is centered, right, we, we compose this image so that we drop it down into that corner, right, such that there's a lot of breathing space and context around this particular image. Now notice also that she's looking that way. Okay? It wouldn't make sense to use the same rule and to put this part of the image in. So she's looking off the edge of the page. Make sense? Right? We want the extra breathing space to be in the direction she's facing. OK. So this is in main. If we were to follow the rule of thirds here, right? where the boat connects in this rainstorm is right at the rule of thirds. Okay. Furthermore, the boat itself is roughly on the third line. And we could take it one step further and say the horizon line is roughly a third, too. Okay? It's a little bit more than a third. Um, but in, we're talking rough. Okay. <coughs> okay. This is in Rhode Island. Okay. On the beach, you're taking a picture of somebody. Okay. My guess is that you've all been to a beach and taken a picture of somebody on the beach. If you haven't, you hiked to the top of a mountain and you took the picture of somebody at the top of the mountain. Okay. The default is, hey, I'm at the beach. Take a picture of me. Centered shot. Me at the beach. Okay. If, however, you change that and you put the person at the rule of thirds instead, something like this, right? you now get context for where the person is. So instead of you being the center of attention, you get you in the environment. You get a better idea of what this is like to be at the scene. So in this case, not a particularly exciting photograph. It's just somebody tying their shoe. right? <laughs> but having it composed so that he's on the rule of thirds helps add a lot more active space to this scene. You wonder, what's he looking at? Right? Notice also that his eye line is a third of the way down. So not only is he on a third of the way over, but what he's looking at is a third of the way down. So we're using those to our advantage, and we're activating the scene with him in it, as opposed to having just a picture of him. Okay? If, however, we switched and we cropped it this way, this technically follows the same rule of thirds. It doesn't work, right? Because he's looking off the page, and we've got a bunch of stuff that doesn't make any difference over here. So how you choose to compose with the rule of thirds still matters, right? You want the extra space to be wherever the person is looking, right? But again, still on the rule of thirds. Just don't do it this way, right? So something like this, still very much rule of thirds, Right? Helicopter falls on the rule of thirds. But obviously, in this particular case, it has a very strong diagonal, too. Okay? The blades are a strong diagonal. So you could use diagonal in this context. You could use rule of thirds, the two layer together. Um, coconut shell, the opening, rule of thirds. Okay? So here's the example of, I hiked the mountain. I'm awesome. Right? be really easy to photograph this so that we were centered right here. No context. Okay? Instead, you put us on the rule of thirds. There we are. Okay? Look at all the context. Look at, we conquered the mountain. This is all what we conquered. Does that make sense? Right? So we're trying to get that broader context. Rule of thirds gets us there. Okay? Landscape scene. This is in Sea Ranch. Anybody heard of Sea Ranch before? Yeah, it was the same way in my first class. So if you are an architecture student and you're in California, at some point during your career as an architecture student, you will have to study Sea Ranch. It's just kind of a rite of passage. Okay? It was a building development done in the 60s and 70s by a group of Berkeley architects, um, particularly well done with a lot of really good characteristics. It's a great case study. Uh, chances are <coughs> you're going to have to study it. Anyway, so this is a picture from up at Sea Ranch. If we look at the rule of thirds, okay, we have a strong place, 
right? At a third of the way over, dense foliage, open view. Okay, strong third there. We move a third of the way up, right? This is all kind of ground, and we get to the open ocean. If we do the other line at the top, at about the third, it's the other side of the bay. Okay, so as we set this up in composition, we deliberately set the vertical at a third, and we set the two horizontals, right? And it makes a really nice quality image. So the next type is something called framing. This is where you're going to use strong lines or something in the foreground to frame another object. Okay? So this is in Pompeii in Italy, right? Looking out a portal toward Pompeii or actually the city of Naples and, and the Bay of Naples, etc. <coughs> strong frame in the window, shot through the window, you get the greater context. There's the frame. Okay, hold on a second. It's about to go. All right, patterns and repetition. This is a really nice kind of image to, to take, right? And that is where we have a single repeating element over and over and over again, right? And from an architectural standpoint, it can be a really nice image. It can be a really nice background. But the key to it is having something that's out of place. So much like the symmetry, it's what's out of place. So here we are, a bunch of balconies, what's out of place? Right? The shirt or the swimsuit or the underwear or whatever it is. Right? So one thing that's out of place, it draws your attention, it makes the image active. Okay? Now if I were to, this is not an image I took, if I were taking this image, I would rather have that swimsuit on this railing at a rule of thirds, third of the way over. Right? But again, I didn't take the image. But the patterns and repetition with the break still makes it a very quality image. Same thing here. Right? In this context, you could argue that it's a radial composition, right? Because we have a, a strong center and we've got elements radiating away from that strong center. But at the same time, I would argue that there's a pattern and repetition to it. We have columns, we have the lights, right? That continue going through. The thing that breaks is the person walking through. And it's a really nice blurry person, right? Uh, so we get that activation of the scene. Uh, something like this, which is, is the last image. <coughs> we have a repetition of these bars. And then we have the snow right, that makes them different. Right? If it was just the picture of bars, it would be far less exciting. So it's what is it that makes it different and exciting. Okay? So I'm going to continue pushing forward a little bit more, talk to you about the exercise. Um, in the exercise, I'm going to ask you to, to go out on campus and photograph some things. Now, this is the first time I've ever taught a night class. Well, guess what? It's dark outside. Okay? makes it kind of hard to go out on campus and photograph things. So what we're going to do instead is we have something that we're going to do in class. Uh, and then I'm going to let you guys out early. Right? So once you do the post for today, you can go. With the assumption that sometime before next class, you'll go through the list and you'll, you'll hit and achieve the photographs that I want you to have. Okay? I want you to have these photographs for next class so that we can actually do the post processing um, in, in um, Photoshop and you can learn Photoshop. Okay, yeah. So you're, you'll bring next class, you'll bring your flash drive, and you'll also bring your camera with whatever you use to photograph the images. Okay? So if you have, like, if your camera has an SD card, all you have to do is bring the SD card because these computers have card readers in them, and you can just read them uh, straight up from the, from the computer. If you do it with your phone, you might have to email <coughs> yourself. If you have some kind of different camera, you, maybe you bring a USB adapter or something. Okay? But let's talk through the exercise. Um, you're going to do a couple things for me. The first thing that I want you to do before you leave today is you're going to search for an image that you think is particularly good. And you could search for it on Flickr. right? You could search for it on Google Images. Um, it doesn't really matter if the image is copywritten because we're just going to talk about the image. We're not trying to plagiarize the image or do anything with the image. Um, if you have trouble picking uh, an image, look for maybe National Geographic images. It's a good, good source of good image. Uh, the Guardian UK has a great set of images. Um, you can look at that as well. So pick an image right, that you think is particularly good. Uh, ideally, it's large enough so that you can actually see some detail. And once you pick that image, <coughs> 
I want you to make some notes about it. What kind of a compositional technique is used? Right? Are they using symmetry with a rule of thirds? Or are they using uh, radial composition? Or what? Okay. So what kind of composition? What other techniques might they be using? Did they use a fast shutter speed or a slow shutter speed? Right? Did they have a shallow depth of field? Is the background blurry or not? Right? So I want you to basically critique and look at this photo and identify those things that make this photo good. Okay? One of the best ways of improving your skill is to look at how professional photographers photograph subjects. Right? They'll make you better just by looking at it. So you're going to pick the image. You're going to write up a little summary of those things that I asked. Um, it can be in bullet port point form. It's not something where I'm going to say, you have to write 200 words about it. I don't care the word count. I just want you to get this information across. Okay? And you're going to make a post that has this image as the featured image, that has your summary, and then has a link to the image. So we have to be able to click and see the image itself, okay? or the website that it came from. So you're going to make that post before you leave today, tagged <clears throat> as exercise 103. You might want to do your comments as well. Okay? Then you're free to go. Okay? The hope is that you're trading the balance of this lab right, for the time it's going to take you to photograph the things that I'm going to ask you to photograph. Okay? So you get out an hour early today, maybe an hour and 20 minutes early. Right? Use that hour and 20 minutes sometime before class at 6 on Wednesday. Okay? So we're going to ask you some, for some things. Okay? We're going to skip down to part three. <coughs> Number one, don't use the presets on your phone, or excuse me, the presets on your camera, right? Or the, um, the auto mode. I can't even talk anymore. It's all running together. Don't use the auto mode on your camera. Use the presets, right? You want something with a blurred background, use the portrait mode. If you want something that's all in focus, use the landscape mode, etc. okay? If you use your phone, right, at least use the exposure compensation, you know, where you tap. Like on your phone, you tap where you want to focus. You kind of drag up or drag down next to it. There's a little sun. This is on an iPhone. And you can make it under or overexposed. At least do that. Okay. So here's what I want. I want five photographs of campus buildings. Right? These are probably the only, things, the only photos that you actually have to take on campus. The rest of them you can take off um, campus tomorrow. Five images of people. Walking, congregating, singing, reading, whatever. Okay? The people images should be the whole person. Don't cut off their legs or their feet or anything else. It should be the whole person. Okay? If it's a pure stranger, they might get weirded out if you took their picture. Maybe you want to ask them first. Right? The other thing is get together with a group of your friends and say, hey, can you sit here and read a book so I can take a picture of you? Right? Chances are they won't get mad at you. All right. Five detail images of textures or patterns. Right, this is a great place for rep <coughs> repetition. Five photographs taken from unexpected angles. I'll leave that up for interpretation. Four macro or close up photographs. If you can, one bracketed set of images. Remember, that's correctly exposed, darker, and lighter. Okay? In an ideal world, you'll set your camera down or on a tripod or something so it's exactly the same view. If you can't do it, I'll have samples when we get to that class day that you can use my samples. But I'd like you to try. One set of panorama images. right? So a couple images that overlap that you can then stitch together after the fact. Right? Minimum three images. If it doesn't work, same thing. I'll have sample images that you can work with. I'd like you to take one self-portrait that could be used as your background for your personal landing page. Doesn't have to be, right? Some, so, a self-portrait. And then I want you to take 25 or more images of stuff, or of whatever you think is interesting. Okay? This is all leading toward your first assignment, which you won't get until um, Wednesday's class which will ultimately be your best photo. For the purposes of your exercises, you can use any images. If you took images before, that's fine. For the assignment, you'll have to use an image that you currently shot right, this semester. You can't go back and look at your pictures from the summer. 
for example. Uh, but for the post-processing uh, in the lecture format, you're welcome to use old images. That's fine. <laughs> so I also included a challenge for anybody that wants to take it on. Uh, as of yet, I've, I've, I haven't had anybody successfully complete it. Right? But I've debated, should this actually be the first assignment or not? And so I kind of throw it out there as a challenge to see if anybody likes it. Right? It's part of making the class and changing it or whatever. And that is to take 30 different images of your mailbox. Okay? 1 through 10, pretty easy. Right? 10 through 20, a little bit harder, but it's probably doable. Right? 20 to 30, really, really hard. Right? So it is definitely challenging. Something for you to think about if you want uh, to take on that challenge. Right? <clears throat> I don't give extra credit for the class, uh, but this is the kind of thing that I'd be willing to bump up your participation grade a bit if you, uh, if you completed it. Okay? But again, it's optional. All right. So um, you'll do the post for part one. Uh, and of course, if you need help, I'll, I'll be here help. <clears throat> and then you're free to go. Um, just make sure you have those images, the around 50 images for next class when we do the post-processing. You won't post-process all 50. You'll select certain ones from within that bunch so that you're working with better quality images. But part of taking a lot of photos is that you can cut it down and find ones that are really good, OK? Because not all of them are going to turn out perfectly. Are there any questions? Yes, sir? Are you um, submitting just every photo? You don't have to submit any of the photos. The only thing you're doing for today is the one post with the one uh, image that you found online with a little bit of a summary of it, OK? The 50 photos, you just bring to class, next class. You don't have to post them. You don't have to do anything to them, OK? And bring also the same image, uh, mailbox photo. Just bring them with you, okay. all right? So no post necessary, just bring them. Any other questions? Yes, sir? Uh, they're in digital format. Yes, all, all of you. You don't have to go get film from the drugstore. I don't even know if they have drugstore. No, CVS still exists. I don't know if they sell film. Anyway, tangent. Digital form, right? You don't even have to bring your camera next class. I just need the actual images. If you're at home and you want to transfer your images onto your flash drive and not bring your camera, that's cool too. I just want the images, right? You just need to have those for Photoshop next class. Anything else? All right, good deal. <clears throat>